<coughs> that long. Chapter 9, Barrels Out of Bond. Bilbo's getting quite used to using his magical ring. He stays with the dwarves in the hall of the Wood Elves. Notice he doesn't just abandon them. And he does find them, okay, and he helps them communicate to each other. We're told, for example, on page 174, that Bilbo takes... Thorn's message to each of the imprisoned dwarves. So it's not like the dwarves are in solitary confinement and they think they've been totally abandoned. They know Bilbo is still safe and free. They know they're all still, uh, each of the others is still alive. Bilbo finally comes up with a way to rescue the elves. The wood elves regularly send wine and provisions down to the men of Dale. Okay? When that happens, they have empty barrels because they send them down via, via the um, river. So what Bilbo does is he, with the dwarves' approval, stuffs, essentially, the dwarves in these, essentially they're like beer kegs, but not, you know, these little beer kegs. I mean big, like 55-gallon. Um, beer kegs. So he rolls them down and they make their way to the town of Dale. I'm going to skip a bunch and pick up with uh, in the chapter A Warm Welcome. Top of 192. Bilbo gets the dwarves out of the barrels, and we're told one of the dwarves had a, hopefully it's the same page, had a famished and a savage look like a dog that has been chained and forgotten in a kennel for a week. It was Thorin, but you could only have told it by his golden chain and by the color of his now dirty and tattered sky-blue hood with its tarnished silver tassel. It was some time before he would be even polite to the hobbit. Okay. Why is Thorin angry at Bilbo? Is it Bilbo's fault that they were captured by the Wood Elves? Is it Bilbo's fault that they weren't treated wonderfully by the Wood Elves? Is it Bilbo's fault that they are now free? Okay. Answers to the first two questions are no. Answer to the third question is yes, which is why Bilbo says, well, are you alive or are you dead? Here you are treating me like scum, but you are alive and you are free. But the narrator goes on. Perhaps he had forgotten that he had had at least one good meal more than the dwarves and also the use of his arms and legs, not to speak of a greater allowance of air. But he goes on. Are you still in prison or are you free? If you want food and if you want to go on with this silly adventure, it's yours after all and not mine. He says, you're the ones who wanted to try to go back to the last lonely mountain and try to defeat Smog. You had better slap your arms and rub your legs and try and help me get the others out while there's a chance. In other words, Thorn, you can sit there and mope and mourn kind of like Hrothgar, as Grindel is terrorizing his kingdom, or what? Like Anodos in Fantasties. Do something. Help. So, Thorne saw the sense of this, and he gets up and he helps Bilbo as he can. So they start to free the other dwarves. So they're all out, page 193. Thorn. well, here we are. And I suppose we ought to thank our stars and Mr. Baggins. What does he mean, thank our stars? We still use a phrase today, not thank our stars. But, you know, before an exam, people say, okay, good luck. Thank your lucky stars. 
Okay. Did the stars have anything to do? Was luck involved at all in their rescue? No. I'm sure he has a right to expect it, though I wish he could have arranged a more comfortable journey. Is he being yeah, a little bit. Still, all very much at your service once more, Mr. Baggins. No doubt we shall feel properly grateful when we're fed and recovered. Notice, we're still hungry, we're still tired and sore and cramped, so we're not feeling that generous right now. But it's pretty easy to feel generous when you're... Well, okay, I was going to say, when you're flushed with food and drink, when you're feeling very comfortable, when life is going just absolutely wonderful, right? Then it's easy to be thankful. And full of gratitude. When is it hard? When you're down on your luck and Yeah, when your stars aren't smiling at you, when everything's falling apart, when you don't feel like anything's going right. Okay? So, Bilbo suggests they should go to Lake Town. They make their way to Lake Town. Okay? Thorin tells them who he is, page 195, when they meet up with the guard. And Thorin says, I am Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thror, king under the mountain. Notice, he cries it in a loud voice. All leaped to their feet. The master of the town sprang from his great chair. But none rose in greater surprise than the raftmen of the elves who were sitting at the lower end of the hall. And they say, These are prisoners of our king that have escaped. The master of the town, is this true? Okay. As a matter of fact, he thought it far more likely than the return of the king under the mountain, if any such person had ever existed. Why, if any such person had ever existed? Go back to the beginning of the tale. Who was at the mountain, or at least in the environs nearby, when Smaug arrived? Thorin and Balin. Okay? They're pretty old. Thorin's father and grandfather were still at the mountain when Smaug arrived. What's this tell us then about the master of Lake Town? Okay, He has no memory of that event. For him, that event was in the long past. Dwarves live a long time. Okay. So, Thorin says, yes, we were prisoners. We were wrongfully waylaid and imprisoned without cause. But lock nor bar may hinder the homecoming spoken of old, nor is this town in the Wood Elves' realm. Okay. So the master hesitates and speaks, looks from one to the other. People are shouting outside the hall, and then we hear some begin to sing snatches of old songs concerning the return of the king under the mountain, that it was Thor's grandson, not Thor himself, that had come back, did not bother them at all. The king beneath the mountains, the king of carven stone, the lord of silver fountain, shall come into his own. His crown shall be upholden, his harp shall be restrung, his halls shall echo, echo golden to songs of yore resung. The woods shall wave on mountains and grass beneath the sun, his wealth shall flow in fountains and the rivers golden run. Notice why they're singing this song. They think if this quote unquote prophecy is true, there's going to be all this wealth flowing from the mountains. The Wood Elves began to wonder greatly. Why? Because they're wondering, can this old prophecy be true? Can this old saying be true? So the master, notice, middle page 197, as for the master, he saw there was nothing else for it but to obey the general clamor, for the moment at any rate. What does that mean? He's not going to disturb 
the jolly or the the jollity and the good times. He's going to go along with it for the moment. Is he a leader? No. He's following the crowd. Okay. So they sing more old songs. The wood elves go back up to their kingdom. And Thorne and the others want to leave. Page 199. The master was not sorry at all to let them go. They were expensive to keep, and their arrival had turned things into a long holiday in which business was at a standstill. He wants to get the dwarves out of his hair because nobody's working. Let them go and bother Smaug and see how he welcomes them. Certainly, oh, Th Thorin Thrain, son of... You must claim your own, the hours at hand, spoken of old. What help can we offer? Okay. So they do give them some offer. Frodo and the dwarves make their way on to the Lonely Mountain. Page 203. They get to the little valley that lies before the mountain. And we're told by Balin. There lies all that is left of Dale. That is, a town that had once lived there that Smaug had long since torched. Okay. Um, just one second. They keep going on. And... Pick up. Page 207. They've found this, what they call doorstep, this, this um, like cutout in the mountain, but there's no door to it. And so they're not feeling so well. Page 207. We get this impression that the dwarves are continually asking Bilbo questions. Keep in mind, he's never been there. Bilbo, you said sitting on the doorstep and thinking would be my job. Not to mention getting inside, so I am sitting and thinking. But the narrator says, but I'm afraid he was not thinking much of the job, but of what lay beyond the blue distance, the quiet western land and the hill and his hobbit hole. Bilbo's thinking, I wish I was back home. Where he had food and comfort. A large gray stone lay in the center of the grass and he stared moodily at it. Thorin, tomorrow begins the last week of autumn. Now, what did Elrond say about those moon runes written on the map? He translated them for them or explained what they meant. And we were told, on Durin's day, when the thrush knocks... Essentially, the door shall be revealed. Okay? Thorin, page 207. Tomorrow begins the last week of autumn. Bifur. And winter comes after autumn. Dwalin. And next year after that. What are they getting at? And we're no closer to our quest. That is, yeah, we might be on the mountain. But we're no closer to getting in the mountain and getting rid of smog. So, Dwalin says, what is our burglar doing for us? Since he has got an invisible ring and ought to be a specially excellent performer now, I'm beginning to think he might go through the front gate, spy things out a bit. He's got a ring that makes him invisible? Yeah. Send him through where, though? Front door. Yeah. Bilbo heard this. And thinks, so that's what they're beginning to think. It is always poor me that has to get them out of their difficulties, at least since the wizard left. Whatever am I going to do? Okay. That night he's miserable, hardly sleeps. The next morning comes. And we're told. Um, as the next day sun sets. 2.08, right in the middle. 
at that very moment, that is, as the sun reaches the level of the horizon, at that very moment he heard a sharp crack behind him. There on the gray stone in the grass was an enormous thrush, nearly coal black. It had caught a snail and it's cracking the snail on the stone. Suddenly Bilbo understood. Forgetting all danger, he stood on the ledge and hailed the dwarves, shouting and waving. They all fell silent. The hobbit stood, standing by the gray stone. The dwarves with wagging beards watched him patiently. Sun sank lower and lower. Okay. The moon was up. The sun is up. And Bilbo cries, the key, the key. Thorn steps up, pulls the key out, puts it in the little keyhole that now shows in the side of the mountain. And they open the door. It's the very last daylight of Durin's day. The door now appears. And we get chapter 12. For a long time, notice, they all stand there in the dark, debating. Okay. This is their entrance. This is what they've been waiting years for. None of them rushes in. Thorin, now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proven to himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit full of courage and resource, far exceeding his size. Now is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn his reward. Hasn't he already earned his reward? He saved them from the spiders. He saved them from the wood elves. Okay. Bilbo, if you mean you think it is my job to go into the secret passages first, O Thorn, Thrain, Sun, Oakenshield, may your beard grow ever longer, say so at once and have done. I might refuse. I have got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain. So that I am, I think, already owed some reward. But... Third time pays for all. Remember what the knight tells Sir Gawain? The third night, he says, third test. It, you know, third time's a charm, so to speak. So, Bilbo says, anyway, I think I will go and have a peep at once and get it over. Who's coming with me? And here's where we discover the true character of the dwarves. The most that can be said for dwarves is this. They intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for his services. They had brought him to do a nasty job for them, and they did not mind the poor little fellow doing it if he would. But they would all have done their best to get him out of trouble, if he got into it. As they did in the case of the trolls at the beginning of their adventures before they had any particular reasons for being grateful to him. There it is. This is the narrator speaking. Dwarves are not heroes. Okay. Why did they hire a burglar at the beginning? It's a passage we didn't talk about. But it's where Tolkien says, there weren't any heroes in the west of the world in these days anymore. They'd all either gone off somewhere, or they were off fighting dragons. Okay, If it says there weren't any heroes, and we have 12 dwarves, then what does that tell us about the dwarves? Early in the story, they're not heroes. There it is. Dwarves are not heroes, but calculating folk with a great idea of the value of money. Some are tricky and treacherous and pretty bad lots. Some are not. But are decent enough people like Thorne and company. Notice, if you don't expect too much. What does that mean, if you don't expect too much? Don't set your standards high. Okay. Don't count on them to pull you out of a pinch. So, Bilbo goes down. And he thinks to himself, now you're in for it, Bilbo. You went and put your foot right in it that night of the party, and now you've got to pull it out and pay for it. 
I have absolutely no use for dragon-guarded treasures, and the whole lot could stay here forever. If only I could wake up and find this beastly tunnel was my own front hall at home. Talking to himself as he goes down. Wake up, Bilbo. Wake up. It's all a bad dream. Wake up. And then he sees a glow. And he goes down. And he also hears a gurgling of some vast animal snoring. And he sees Smaug. Page 213. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought. That is, gold turned into chain, turned into bracelets and stuff, and just gold bars and gold nuggets. Gems and jewels and silver, red stained in the ready light. Now notice, there's this huge pile, and Smaug is curled up on top of it, just like the dragon in Beowulf. Smaug lay with wings folded like an immeasurable bet, partly turned. Uh, excuse me, turned partly on one side so that the hobbit could see his underparts and his long pale belly crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long lying on his costly bed. He's kind of sleeping like a cat. Okay? Forearms are kind of like this and his body stretched out almost on his side and his tail all curled up showing chest and gut area. Okay? Behind him, where the, walls, where the walls were nearest, could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging. And there in rows stood great jars and vessels, filled with a wealth that could not be guessed. Okay. Bilbo had heard tell and sing of dragon hordes before, but the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. The lust the desire for it. So he gazes at a long time, for a long time. He goes up to the nearest piece of the mound, we're told. He sees Smaug way up above him, because this is a huge pile. And he grasps a great two-handled cup, as heavy as he could carry. Smaug stirs a bit, and Bilbo runs. He runs all the way back up. He shows the dwarves what he found, passes it from hand to hand. When they hear a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath, as if it was an old volcano that had made up its mind to start eruptions. Why does Smaug wake up? Because the piece has been stolen. It's, I mean, Tolkien lifts this right out of Beowulf. Okay? Why does the dragon Beowulf wake up? Because the guy, exactly, because the thief stole the cup. Okay, so what does Smaug do? Smaug comes out, thieves, fire, murder, such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. In other words, what has Smaug been doing since he first came to the mountain? He's been asleep. He's been asleep. Okay, the whole time. And so he starts to torch the surrounding countryside. The dwarves go inside the tunnel. Okay. Smaug closes the door. The beasts, we're told, are going to be killed and such. Um, Smaug sees the ponies. And notice, he's a sentient dragon. That is, he uses reason. And he figures out where the ponies and horses came from. Okay. Um, page 218. They debated long on what was to be done, but they could think of no way of getting rid of Smaug, which had always been a weak point in their plans. In other words, their plans were get to the Lonely Mountain, steal the treasure, 
Point three, which should be point one, deal with Smaug. How are you going to steal the treasure if you can't get past Smaug? Then, as is the nature of folk that are thoroughly perplexed, they began to grumble at the hobbit, blaming him for what at first so pleased them. Bringing away a cup. I mean, he's a burglar, right? He did what he was supposed to do. But good burglars don't get caught. Bilbo, what else do you suppose a burglar is to do? I was not engaged to kill dragons. That's warrior's work. I made the best beginning I could. Did you expect me to trot back with the whole horde of Thror in my back? If there's any grumbling to be done, I think I might have a say. You ought to have brought 500 burglars, not one. So Thorin says, well, what do you propose we do, Mr. Baggins? I have no idea. If you're talking about getting the treasure. That obviously depends entirely on some new turn of luck in the getting rid of Smaug. Okay. What are we to do now? This moment. In other words, Smaug's another problem. What should we be doing right now? Bilbo. We can do nothing but stay where we are. By day we can no doubt excuse me, creep out safely enough to take the air. Perhaps before long, one or two could be chosen to go back to the store by the river, replenish our supplies. Okay. He says, but I'll, I'll make you an offer. I've got my ring. I'll creep down this very noon. See what Smaug is up to. Maybe something will turn up. Okay. So he goes back down. Smaug has come back. And we're told, Smaug certainly looked fast asleep. And Bilbo peeps out from the entrance. He was just about to step out onto the floor, this is page 220, when he caught in a sudden, thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smaug's left eye. He's not all the way asleep. Well, thief, I smell you and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along, help yourself again. And I would really recommend, get on YouTube, and I think you can search for, for this. Search for Richard Boone Smaug. If you've ever seen the um, cartoon version of this, that was done in like 77, 75, something like that. Richard Boone was a famous Hollywood kind of character actor. Did a lot of westerns back in the 50s and 60s. He did the voice for Smaug okay, in that Rankin Bass cartoon version. It's the best voice there is. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch has got a great voice and everything. I've not seen the, the film. I've seen clips of him as Smaug. But his voice just isn't gravelly like a dragon's ought to be. Okay? Anyways, Bilbo was not quite so learned in dragon lore. And so he says, no, thank you, Smaug, the tremendous. Notice what he does. He starts to flatter Smaug. I did not come for presents. I only wished to have a look at you and see if you were truly as great as tales say. I did not believe them. Notice what the dragon does. Do you now, says the dragon, somewhat flattered. Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the, of the reality. O oh, Smaug, the chiefest and greatest of calamities. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar. He says, you know my name, but I don't know yours. Where do you come from? Bilbo, you may indeed. And what does he start to do? He riddles. I come from under the hill and under the hills and over the hills my path led. And through the air, I am he that walks unseen. What does he mean? I come from under the hill. <clears throat> okay. That comes up later. In the Lord of the Rings, he's, uh, Frodo is called Underhill. Okay. He lives where? In a hole. Under a hill. Okay. And he came under the hills, Misty Mountains, and over the hills, 
My pad's left. Smaug, so I can well believe, but that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web cutter, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. All right? Lovely titles, but lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them alive again from the water. I came from the end of a bag, bag end, but no bag went over me when the elves caught them. I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles, Bayorn, the eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer. I am, and this is when he gives way too much. Barrel Rider. That's better, says Smaug. Smaug knows about the barrels that come down from the Wood Elves Kingdom to the men of the town, Lake Town. Okay. So the narrator tells us this is how you're supposed to talk to dragons and such. So, Smaug says, maybe Barrel was your pony's name, page 222, and maybe not, though it was fat enough. You may walk and seen, but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night, and I shall catch and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Now, is that a good piece of advice or bad piece of advice? It's good. He's actually telling the truth there. Bilbo, dwarves? Don't talk to me. Bilbo's pretending, I don't know anything about dwarves. I know the smell and taste of dwarf, no one better. Don't tell me that I can eat a dwarf-ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends. I don't mind if you go back and tell them so for me. But he can't make out hobbit smell. I suppose you got a fair price for that cup last night. Notice, he knows what was stolen. How? Because in Germanic fashion, dragons are like accountants. They know to the very last jot and tittle of every piece of their hoard. So even if Bilbo had stolen a little nugget of gold the size of my fingernail, Smaug would have known what was missing. All right? Come now, did you? Nothing? Well, it's just like them. I suppose they're skulking outside, and your job is to do all the dangerous work. What is Smaug trying to do? Yeah. Will you get a fair share? Don't you believe it? If you get off alive, you will be lucky. Now Bilbo's feeling uncomfortable. Why? Because Smaug's ideas are starting to kind of nestle in his mind. And because Smaug's eye is kind of roving and looking for him. This is a little bit of foreshadowing for Lord of the Rings and Sauron's eye. You don't know everything, O Smaug the Mighty. Not gold alone brought us hither. Ah, so now you say us. Why not say us 14 and be done with it? Mr. Lucky Number. I don't know if it has occurred to you that even if you could steal the gold bit by bit, a matter of a hundred years or so, you could not get it very far. Not much use on the mountainside. Bless me, had you ever thought of the catch? That is, you go running off into the wild blue... Did you ever think of how you're going to get it away? A 14th share? What about delivery? That is, they promised you could have one 14th. What did the contract not say? How it would be delivered. What about cartage? What about armed guards and tolls? And he laughs. And now Bilbo is suddenly taken aback. He had never bothered to wonder how the treasure was to be removed or get back home. And now he starts, that, that suspicion starts to eat away at him. Had the dwarves forgotten this important point? Doesn't seem like they forget any other thing, any other things. Okay. So Bilbo just kind of speaks without thinking. 
He said, I tell you, he said, in an effort to remain loyal to his friends, that gold was only an afterthought with us. We came over hill and under hill by wave and wind for revenge. He smiled. Revenge? The king under the mountain is dead, and where are his kin that dare seek revenge? Geary on Lord of Dale is dead. I've eaten his people. I kill where I wish, and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old, and their like is not in the world today. Okay. How does Beowulf begin? Lo, we have heard of, heard of the glory of the Spear Danes of long ago. In other words, these kind of heroes aren't around anymore. And Smaug starts to brag. Then I was young and tender. He says, now I'm old and strong. My armor is like tenfold shields. And Bibble says, I've always heard that dragons have a chink in their armor somewhere. A little hole. Smaug, not me. Okay, and he raises himself up, spreads his arms and wings wide like this to show himself entirely to Bilbo. And we're told that Bilbo says, da, 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 da. page 225, dazzling, marvelous, old fool. He thinks, why there is a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bears a snail out of its shell. A snail out of its shell has no protection. He's got a missing piece of armor, as it were. Okay? So, Bilbo goes back up to the dragons, uh, excuse me, to the dwarves. Smaug comes out again. Okay? He leaves the mountain so that Bilbo and the dwarves then go down to the treasure hoard. And their lust is awakened. And Bilbo finds the Arkenstone. Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch. Page 235, Bilbo finds the Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain, the most important and precious jewel of the entire Dwarvish hold. It's the one thing above all that Thorin wants, and Bilbo takes it. Okay? Because after all, the agreement was he gets a 14th share. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch again. Let's see. They march out to kind of set up defenses. Chapter 14. We go back to Smaug, and Smaug goes to the men of Lake Town, or Eskaroth, and torches it. Bilbo has told the thrush about the weak spot on Smaug, and the thrush speaks to Bard. He tells Bard where the point is, or where the weak spot is. Chapter 15. Uh, da, 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 da. The men of Lake Town come up to the dwarves in the mountain, they tell him, they tell them, Smaug is dead okay, at our hands, at Bard's hands. Therefore, you should help, you should give some of your treasure to us. Because you wouldn't have any of that treasure if Smaug weren't dead. Okay? What is Thorin's reply? No. Yeah, no. It's our treasure. It's not our fault, it is actually, that, you know, the dragon tried to torture town, etc., etc. Okay? So the, dra the dwarves go back to the mountain. And what do we see? We see a lineup of dwarves on the mountain, elves come down, men. So we have three armies that are getting ready to battle. 
Chapter 16, A Thief in the Night. Bilbo takes the Arkenstone and he goes down to the Men of Dale. Excuse me, the um, Men of Lake Town. Okay. And he gives them page 270, 271. He gives them the Arkenstone. He says, it is the heart of the mountain, and it is also the heart of Thor, and he values it above a river of gold. I give it to you. It will aid you in your bargaining. How is it yours to give? Well, it isn't exactly, but I'm willing to let it stand against all my claim, that is, against my one-fourteenth. Thorin will deal for it. <laughs> okay. Gandalf congratulates Bilbo on a job well done, and we get the clouds burst. What does this mean? We now have... The dwarves of Dane, okay, Thorin's cousin, come in. So we have two sets of dwarves, two tribes of dwarves, as it were, who are getting ready to fight a battle against men and elves. And when the battle starts, all hell breaks loose. Why? Because who else joins it? It becomes the battle of five armies. Goblins and wargs, goblins riding the wargs, and then the eagles come in. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a bunch. <clears throat> the battle ends and go to chapter 18. Bilbo comes to himself because he passes out. Page 285 is when he falls and passes out. Um, chapter 18, Bilbo comes to himself and he wonders what's happened. And a man finds Bilbo, takes his ring off, and he says, It's me, Bilbo Baggins, companion of Thorin. The man says, It's well that I've found you. You are needed. We have looked for you long. You would have been numbered among the dead, who are many, if Gandalf the wizard had not said that your voice was last heard in this place. Are you much hurt? Bilbo says, no, I'm fairly okay. So he's taken to where Thorin is, bottom of 287. There indeed lay Thorin Oakenshield, wounded with many wounds. His rent armor and notched axe were cast upon the floor. Okay. Farewell, good thief. I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers. Now, prior to this speech, what was Bilbo's last speech with Thorin? And he talked to him about the Arkenstone. When Thorin finds out that Bilbo has stolen the Arkenstone, Thorin essentially curses him. Not curses at him. Curses him. Like, wishes him in a very dark, bad place. Now, farewell, good thief. I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I leave now all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth. Remember what the Beowulf poet repeatedly says about the value of gold and treasure. It buys man nothing eventually. I wish to part in friendship from you and I would take back my words and deeds at the gate. Bilbo kneels down before him. Farewell, king under the mountain. This is a bitter adventure, if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. I am glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. What's he mean? I am glad that I have shared in your perils. I think Bilbo is saying, I am a better person for having gone off on this adventure. Okay? Thorin, no. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. What does the Beowulf poet put in the mouth of Hrothgar about Beowulf? That he tempers courage, bravery, with prudence, with wisdom. 
Tolkien has just said the same thing about Bilbo. He's just equated Bilbo with what Hrothgar says about Beowulf. Bilbo obviously isn't a Beowulf, though, is he? Okay. Some courage, some wisdom, blended in measure. Meaning, not overly courageous and not overly full of wisdom. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. What does he mean, food, cheer, and song? It's all three of them together. Where do we experience all three of those? Food, cheer, and song. Or storytelling. Or joking around. Home? Where else? Gathering. Keep going. Like a meat hall? Like yeah! Such like With a bunch of people. Thorin is saying... If we valued community, if we, if we valued our relationship with others more than hoarded gold. Most people don't have hoards of gold today, though. What do they have? Bank accounts. Stocks. Material wealth. If we valued our interactions with other people, more than our stuff. There's nothing so disconcerting as to see a group of people out for dinner and they're at a table and every stinking one of them is looking at their cell phone. Okay. Where's, where's the community in that? Where's the relationship in that? The world would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Bilbo turns away, sat alone wrapped in a blanket, and wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. Weeps till he doesn't have any tears left to cry and until his voice is gone. And says, The mercy it is that I woke up when I did. Why? They got their goodbyes. Okay. What did that allow Thorne to do? He got his apology in. Okay. I wish Thorne were living, but I'm glad that we parted in kindness. If you've read Lord of the Rings, it's almost the exact same thing we see when Boromir dies. Okay. He is able to apologize. And what does Aragorn do? No, you've conquered. You've won. You've won an amazing battle here. Okay? And now Bilbo thinks you're a fool, Bilbo Baggins, and you made a great mess of that business with the stone. And there was a battle in spite of all your efforts to buy peace and quiet. But I suppose you can hardly be blamed for that. That is, he did his best, but his best didn't take away what from Thorin. His freedom. Thorin could choose to do how he was going to. Okay? So he makes his way on home. They say goodbye to the elves. Okay? And they go past Elrond's. And bottom of 301. We're told when Bilbo arrives back home. Indeed, Bilbo found that he had lost more than spoons because people had been in stealing his stuff. He had lost his reputation. It is true that forever after he remained an elf friend and had the honor of dwarves, wizards, and all such folk as ever passed that way. But he was no longer quite respectable. He was an odd bird, in other words. He was, in fact, held by all the hobbits of the neighborhood to be queer, strange, out of the ordinary, except by his nephews and nieces on the Took side. Okay? But Bilbo didn't care. He was quite content. Go down to the bottom of page 303. 
Balin comes and visits, says there's a new master of the town who's kind and popular and all this kind of stuff. He says they're making songs which say that in his day the rivers run with gold. Bilbo. So the old prophecies, the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion. Gandalf, of course. And why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. Gandalf is suggesting Bilbo doesn't think the prophecies could have been true because he was involved in them. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, just for your sole benefit? You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I am very fond of you. But you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world, after all. What does he mean by that? Okay. The story is The Hobbit, or There and Back Again. Gandalf says, you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a part in them. Meaning, you had a part in these tales. You're a fine fellow, but you're just a little small person in a much wider world. Meaning, those tales grow ever larger and larger and bigger and bigger. Bilbo has a little part in them. He is like to use an example from Shakespeare, a player on a stage. But the player on the stage is not necessarily the focus of the play. Might be, as in Hamlet. But there are other plays going on at the same time. This could as easily have been a novel about foreign Oakenshield, where Bilbo plays a small part rather than a novel about Bilbo, where Thorin Oakenshield plays a small part. Okay? What Tolkien seems to be suggesting is that all stories are interrelated. And it's just when we focus on one that we suddenly get a central figure or hero okay, to um, look at. Okay, we'll stop there. We're going to do... Um,